My name is Mike Butcher. I'm the have a seat. I'm the editor at large of uh, TechCrunch. That means I get to do something called larging it uh, all over the place, which is great fun. That's a British joke. Um, I used to be European editor. Europe's not big enough for me, so I have to be large now. Um, this is gonna, um, there's a very sort of p pitiful clap at the back there for the Microsoft thing. It's just a bit, bit of a shame. So we're going to uh, see if we can't get you a little bit more excited. Um, it's great to be, I think this is a bloody great venue, don't you? This is great. Uh, I think it's way better than last year. Last year was good, but this is better. This. Um, and uh, one of the things I think is very interesting coming to Israel, coming to Tel Aviv, is that, uh, is that uh, as I was quoted uh, in uh, one of the newspapers in a couple of years ago, I said, if you throw a stone in Tel Aviv, you'll hit a, an entrepreneur. But then, of course, we don't want to throw too many stones now, do we? Um, now, what's going to happen next is I'm going to do a little bit of interview with Rahul Sood here from Microsoft. Um, and then we'll open up to questions. I honestly have no idea how much long, long I've got for this. What is it, about 40 minutes? 40 minutes, okay. That's fine by me. We'll do that. We'll fill that up. And we'll do some questions as well later on. So without further ado, how are you? How are you? Good, how are you? Now, do you like the weather here? Do you prefer it to Canada? Uh, yeah, I think the weather here is very nice. I was surprised, actually, how hot it is here. Um, but yes, I do. I prefer it to... I was from Calgary, as you That's know. That's because you're still wearing, you're still dressing like a, a, know, a like a North Cat, Northern, Northern American with a T-shirt and everything. We're gonna have to, what do we think? We have to do some sort of fashion analysis of you. Yeah, you got well, the whole sneakers up. Oh, yes, that's right, because you're working with startups now, so you're doing the dress down that's, thing. That's right. So what's, yeah. what's, what, tell us about fashion at Microsoft. Is it, is it uh, you know, are people still wearing, you know, buttoned up suits and t-shirts underneath and everything? Most people tuck their shirts in all the way down to their shorts. Do they tuck them into they, their, they, they into their, their underpants, yeah, exactly. to their briefs? That's right. That's we have right. a very famous British Prime Minister who used to be pictured in a cartoon with his briefs his shirt tucked into his briefs, All which the way pretty down. much summed him up as a person. No, I, I, um, I mean, you know, in, in terms of uh, dress code, there, there really isn't one there. I mean, people just dress however they want to dress, and in Seattle, it's very grunge, so that's what it is. It is what it is. In, in, uh, in Berlin, I was passed by somebody on a cycle wearing a full-blown gimp suit. Gimp suit? Yeah. Do awesome. you think that would go down well at Microsoft? <laughs> I don't know if anyone, does people know what a gimp all the people laughing do. Um, now, I'm going to ask you a serious question now. Yes, please. You're the global general manager. Honestly, if I had known you were going to ask me, I did not expect the gimp suit question, but that's okay. Okay, go ahead. Go uh, ahead. We, well, in that case, we'll return to that. All right. Um, global general ma manager for startups and Microsoft, when you were employed, are you videoing this? That's fine, you can video it. Oh, it's just photographs, that's fine. Um, people holding up cameras like this is odd. Um, when you were appointed at Microsoft, uh, you basically, you, you took over this thing, right, and, and you, you took a role on that, and it, it seemed to me like you were floundering around. You're a very, you're a very experienced person, you did Voodoo, PC, HP, you, hold on, let me just rewind, let's go back. Late 1990s, you're doing Voodoo, PC, you go to uh, Hewlett Packard, it was a very, very different environment then, wasn't it? Well, actually, so um, I started Voodoo when I was in high school in 91, and then, and then sold it to Hewlett Packard in 2006. This is after we had, uh, you know, Michael Dell contacted us in 2005, and actually he, Michael Dell called me at home in 2005 to talk about my company. What did he say? Hello, my name's Michael Dell. He said, hello, my name is Michael Dell, and I did what anyone would do and say, yeah, right, and I hung up the phone. And, uh, and then within two minutes, I got an email from Michael Dell saying, no, it really was Michael Dell. And I called to talk to you about your company, so would you like to talk? And then, uh, you know, I basically had a heart attack and then immediately called him back and we started chatting about the company. What was he like? Uh, you know, he's a really smart guy, um, really nice, really cares about his company. Um, he's, he's a founder that really cares about his, his business. Um, 
But I don't think we aligned, uh, our visions aligned, really, uh, to what we wanted to do versus what, what he was looking to do. He ended up buying Alienware, didn't he? Well, this is after we talked. So, so basically what happened was I spent about a month uh, talking to Michael Dell. I went to Round Rock, spent time with him. Um, we shared our vision for Voodoo and what we were trying to do. We were basically building uh, a premium brand that we thought could help lift their brand upstream. And, um, and, and so when, when, our, when our goal was to actually create a really innovative product for, for Dell and, and to, to help lift their brand upstream, his goal was to grow top line revenues. So our goal was about innovation and design and their goal was about sales. And, uh, and, and so we did not align whatsoever. So we walked away and then within a month they bought Alienware, which was our next largest competitor. I think they, they bought them for about $400 million. And that's when HP came and started really, really hitting us up hard to, to, to buy us. And so, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. I mean, uh, HP bought the company in 2006. Um, I was there, I was super excited, you know, at, at first. I mean, when, when you build, as, as any founder knows, when you build a company from the ground up, you care about the culture, you care about the brand, and, and you're really building a, a, a culture and a product that, uh, that generates evangelism and it becomes the soul or the foundation of your brand, essentially. And, uh, and, and none of that meant anything to anybody at HP. So, you know, at first, everything went really well. I spent about um, a year working there, and then I spent about two years physically. My body was there, but my mind was somewhere else completely. So the culture of HP sucks, is that what you're saying? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I'm just saying that the culture was completely different from, you know, when, as, as, a, as a founder, there's, there's got to be something you think about when you think of the culture of a company. For example, at Microsoft, the culture at Microsoft is a culture of giving. It, and it stems from Bill Gates. It stems oh, from. Oh come on! I'm serious. I am absolutely serious. I have to tell you that there, there is a complete polar opposite um, kind of uh, perception of Microsoft from the outside than there is on the inside. But when you're on the inside, this culture of giving is really there. It is because every year we have this giving campaign. We all do the, all this charitable work and this and that. But but that's the foundation of the company. You know. Um, the, the, the culture at, uh, at, at, at every company you can think of, at Ferrari, it's a foundation of racing. You know, at Apple, it's, it's, it's about creating you know, really beautiful products. That, that, well, it's that, about n sort of Nazi-style secrecy around technology sure, projects. Sure. sure, but there's always something you think about when you think about the foundation of a company. So as a founder, when you're creating your company, you think, what is it that I want to create, and what is the soul of the culture of my company? And at HP... I, I just couldn't identify that soul. I, I, I couldn't put a face to the company. Like, when you think about the company, when you think about Apple, who do you think about? Well, obviously Steve Jobs. Right. And when you think about, you know, Ferrari, you think of Enzo Ferrari. When you think of Microsoft, you think of Bill Gates. Every time I thought of Hewlett Packard, I couldn't think of a, of a person. When I thought of Dell, I thought of Michael Dell. So you always think about the founder. And what usually happens after a company loses their founder, they, um, you know, you get from CEO to CEO to CEO. And eventually, you, 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 risk that, you risk losing the what foundation of your what culture. What you're basically implying, though, is that the entire startup culture of acquisition, uh, the entire sort of cycle of acquisition of startups by large corporates effectively doesn't work, though. Isn't that the, impl the implication of what you're saying? I, I'm, I'm basically saying that, yes, as a founder of a startup company, if you are going to be acquired by a larger company, you want to make sure that it is structured in a way that you keep the foundation of your company, which is the soul, the brand, the culture that you created. You have to have created a hermetically sealed organization. Not, inside not always, no, because, um, you know, for example, with, with, well, you could argue that Microsoft bought Skype late, right? I mean, we paid $8 billion for the company, but, but you, could say that, you could say that it was actually a very successful acquisition for the company because the, the culture is still there, the company remains, the brand is there, and, and, and people still care about the company. But, but in many cases, you know, you look at a company like Palm, Right? As an example, Palm was acquired by HP and, and you know, it, I think it was a year and a half before they, they completely shut the whole thing down. That was, yes. Well, I mean, the Palm OS thing didn't really work out for them, did it? I just think that, I just, I, I don't know if it was the Palm OS that didn't work out for them. I just think of overall execution and the fact that they brought in a new CEO. Like, who, who knows what, why things happen the way they happen. But typically, when you do an acquisition, as a, as a corporate strategic when when a company does a major acquisition they have somebody there who had the 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 thought to buy this company for a very specific reason and if for whatever reason that person leaves or the big change happens 
Um, sometimes I can create. I want to. I want to get onto some other things, but I want to sure. ask you one more quick question on this sort of general area, which is uh, where Yahoo acquired a whole bunch of companies during the sort of Web 2.0 era, like Delicious and people like that, and sort of left, sort of mothballed them. They just sort of ran on servers. I mean, that didn't work either, right? No, you know. It, it's it's kind of weird to me actually when I think of what what Yahoo is currently doing right now. You know where they go out and they and they shop and they buy a bunch of companies. The idea is to buy entrepreneurial culture inside your company. The problem is when you have a bunch of entrepreneurs inside of a large organization, what happens? I mean, you know, really entrepreneurs are people that are free spirits that like to go and create things and get stuff done quickly, and. You just cannot have a company of you know forty thousand entrepreneurs. It's it's just not going to work ever. And so I don't know. We like herding cats. Yes, yeah, like herding cats. So so you know entrepreneurs. I mean, my team is full of entrepreneurs, and I have to say, my team is probably the most culturally diverse and globally dispersed team at Microsoft. I would argue, and many entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs are very emotional people. You know, we really care about delivering something, and and. And sometimes in a big organization, it's it's hard to kind of manage that. It's hard to manage their expectations and 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 keep them, you know, sort of uh, aligned with the culture of the company. Okay, let me just get onto this. So, sure. yeah, you you joined you joined Microsoft. Uh, you, you left um, HP. Eventually joined Microsoft. Um, you twiddle your thumbs a little bit, from what I can gather, and then came up with this idea, the Bing Fund. Yes. And so. This is a fairly early days for this. Now, what I would like to know from you is that Microsoft is now operating a number of different programs. We've got Microsoft Ventures, we've got the BizPark program, BizPark One, and now we've got Bing, Bing Fund. Now, all of these admittedly are somewhat overlapping. You've also got the accelerators, which are building out globally now. You've got an announced one in uh, Israel, of course. Uh, you've announced in uh, Sao Paulo. I mean, this is getting a little bit complicated. Is are we not going to see the point where, this is my question, is that are we not going to get to the point where startups are now going to have a problem? There'll be turf wars now internally inside of Microsoft about who's going to deal with these startups and what's going to happen next. Isn't that going to be create chaos? No, you know what? In fact, um, your, your, um, your, your point about all the different brands and all the different teams is absolutely correct, but, but the consolidation was Microsoft Ventures. So in other words, um, you know, I started the Bing Fund inside of Microsoft because I was looking for something to do. And, and I wanted to do something that I understand. I understand entrepreneurs. I was an angel investor. I had invested in 40 companies uh, myself. Um, and, you know, every time I would go out to the startup ecosystem and speak to my friends, they would be like, they would say to me, the first thing they would say is, why are you still at Microsoft? You know, what are you doing at Microsoft? And, and, and I realized that, you know, in the company where you're surrounded by brilliant people, everybody is smarter than me. What am I going to do to add value? And, um, and so I went out and decided that Microsoft needs to, we, we, we have a, a, a bunch of things that we need to think about. First of all, the, the, the startup ecosystem is changing. The barriers for entry for technology have never been lower. The accelerants have never been higher. And, uh, and because of that, you can have small teams go out and create really disruptive things. Second thing is, from a perception standpoint, Microsoft really, we missed the, uh, the open source movement. And as a result of that... Well, Microsoft missed the internet, it missed the open source movement, it missed uh, mobile, it missed quite a number of things, So, so there's a lot of things that we did is it, well. Is there any real guarantee that it's not going to carry on missing no, things? Well, you know, you know what, there's a lot of things that the company has missed, a lot of things that the company has done well. I mean, you know, um, I, I don't want to sort of get into the, you know, the cash and how it keeps adding to the balance sheet and all of that other stuff, because it doesn't mean anything. What, what, re what really matters is that, you know, the, the company is... Um, we, we did miss in the open source movement, right? And we did, we, 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 we need to change the perception. We needed to go out and create a program, that I believe, that would really resonate with entrepreneurs. Because the open source movement is fundamentally opposed to Microsoft, surely. Well, you see, the problem Please is... Completely different sides of the fence. The, the problem with the open source thing is there's outdated perceptions that open source is actually cheaper than, than, than Microsoft and that Microsoft does not embrace open source, neither of which is true. We actually do embrace open source. For example, our cloud, Azure, is fully open source compatible now. It's fully, you know, you can, you can do infrastructure as a service and you can host anything on it. And, and so let me finish my initial thought about, about the different brands you talked about. So we had all these teams working on different things. I was working on the Bing Fund. Zach was working on accelerators. Uh, we had this other team working on BizSpark. And, you know, we had like 20 different teams working on 20 different things for startups. And eventually, you know, uh, we just got together and said, like, enough is enough. 
We have to come up with a program that will resonate with entrepreneurs around the world and come up with a very clear value proposition. And that is how Microsoft Ventures came about. So all of this stuff that you talk about, BizSpark, accelerators, everything, it all rolls up under one team. That's the team that I'm running right now. That is called Microsoft Ventures. And our value proposition is really clear. It's, you know, we have the largest footprint in the enterprise. We have the most customers in the enterprise space than, than anybody. And, and we're a very large company. We know how to build software. So imagine if you, if you are building a software company and you want access to the enterprise, we can help you. So we'll help you build your business and we'll help you get access to customers that, that you won't be able to get anywhere else very quickly. I think, I mean, it, it sounds wonderful on paper, but one of the things that, I mean, what if, if I'm a consumer uh, oriented start? Does that mean guy, you guys aren't interested? No, not at all. In fact, um, in fact, from a consumer standpoint, you think about it as a, a B2B to C type thing. You know, we have many of our enterprise customers deal with consumers. And, and believe me, all of these companies, like the majority of these big companies are freaking out about the startup space right now. They're freaking out about entrepreneurs being able to go out and, you know, three to four to five people can go out and create a company that can disrupt them in a massive way. So they all want access to these entrepreneurs and they all want access to be able to, to, to innovate like this. And so we have a platform that helps them connect to entrepreneurs. Our accelerators are amazing and we're, we're, bringing in, we're bringing in Fortune 500 partners into our accelerators to work with these companies that are coming out of the accelerators. It's pretty amazing. Um, one thing though, um, you've got some, you've still got this perception that problem though. I mean, how long do you think it's going to be before, you know, your nirvana start, does exist where, you know, you are embraced by open source movement. Journalists stop using MacBooks and start using PCs. Uh, Windows Surface or whatever. Yeah. I mean, what, how, how long do you think that? Have you got a five-year plan? Is it like a Chinese great leap forward? Or how, what's the window on well, this? Well, look, you know, in, in, in a world where, uh, you know, we have challenges, right? Um, we, have, we, have a, we have a number of different challenges to, to, to face. But let me just put it this way. The best thing we can do at Microsoft Ventures is to help create successful startups. If we can do that and we can demonstrate really great exits... Um, then over time we're going to start to change perception. I can say without hesitation that people who come to our accelerator, we don't tell them you have to develop on Windows or you have to use .NET. We don't say that. In fact, we say develop on whatever you want, whatever stack you want, and, you know, and if you decide to come on our cloud, we'll be able to help you get access to customers, we'll be able to help you build a successful business. The bottom line is, um, in order for us to change perception, we have to go and create these companies and we have to embrace the startup ecosystem and help them on their terms build really great companies. Um, as far as the rest of it goes, as far as Windows and all the other stuff that, 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 that's going on, look, I'm just trying to build a brick house inside of a tornado at Microsoft Ventures, right? You, when I say a tornado, look, we've had reorgs, you know, we have Steve B just announced that he's leaving the company, you know, we have a new CEO that's, you know, will be coming on, I'm sure, Steve at some Bama. point in time. We don't know who that will be. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, whatever happens, it is a big company and big company stuff is going to happen. But, you know, I just want to make sure that Microsoft Ventures is really successful and, and what's going to dictate our success is creating How success. dependent are you on an entirely new uh, CEO coming in and thinking, well, this is great, guys. I, I love what you're doing here, but we're totally reorienting yeah. the company now. We've decided to go and uh, go up against... Uh, uh, <clears throat> Ford. Somebody, Ford, yeah. yes. Exactly. GM. We're going to start building cars now, yeah. not software anymore. Steam you know, I, 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 don't, I don't see that happening. I, I really think that Microsoft has a, um, you know, it's a, it's a very large company. It's got a lot of businesses. It's a complex organization. It's, um, you know, I, I can't imagine getting a CEO for such a big company with so many different businesses is going to be easy. But, but I will say this, um, that the, the company is, has, has some great leaders at the most senior level of the organization, we have some amazing leaders. We have people like Tony, uh, T Tony Bates, Satya Nadella, Chi Lu, like some amazing, amazing thought leaders. And, um, and, and ever since this, this whole reorg came about, and everybody is working on, you know, their, and we have one PL now, not seven, I think the company is starting to behave like one company. It's actually a really neat, you know, so, place uh, to be. so let's talk Turkey. Are you making an investment? Any investments have you made any? Are you about to announce any? What's, what's, give, give us some news so we can, we'll tweet it or something. <laughs> sure. So, so we made a number of investments. Um, and, and we, you know, as far as our seed investments go, we made a number of investments. We just made our first seed investment as Microsoft Ventures in Israel that we're announcing today in a company that went through our accelerator. It's called Sky Giraffe. Um, and... Uh, 
this company is actually really cool. Um, it's uh, it's it's I, I I think you should you should meet the CEO. Um, what do they do? Yeah, I don't know where he is right now. Oh, there he is, right here. So yeah, um, go, dude, dude, get off stage. We're doing an interview. Yeah. 